Yes. A, a couple of comments. Um, the Ann Arbor Interfaith Roundtable doesn't talk about this either. Just so you know, you're going. I know you're going to Ann Arbor, and um, for the same reasons that you mentioned, they, they don't talk about it either. They, they think they do. Right? Well, they do. No, I don't think they really do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They say it's off limits. Um, on the table, I think it's off limits. I mean, in the gathered group, I think it's it's pretty off limits. I mean, there may be some conversations on the fringes, but in the gathered group, my understanding is it's been off limits. Right. Um, for scary. the same reasons that you mentioned. Uh, also, you talked about um, you know what to do in terms of the grassroots coming out of the academy and churches, and and uh, you mentioned the number of church groups that do pilgrimages each year to the Holy Lands. And, um, uh, I know that the Presbyterian Church and the General Assembly um, resolution this, this summer uh, specifically encourages people to visit the region and worship and talk with indigenous Christians there. Mm -hmm. A lot of the church groups that go on pilgrimages don't do that. Mm -hmm. They go and, and they will do worship within their own community of the tour group in some of the designated places like the Top of the Mount of Olives, you know, in the Garden Tomb area. You know, there are places that are set up for your group to do worship there. And they will do that. They will completely stay separated mm -hmm. from the entire situation, and they'll go and they'll have a fairly sanitized experience of the tour. Um, but one of the things that we were uh, that we're encouraging people to do is, when you go there, go there and meet with indigenous Christian people. You know, talk about the Kairos document. Talk about you know what what their experience is, and worship with English speaking. So when you go around and talk to churches, encourage the same, because. Yeah, I, I'm sure that you do, but I, I want to give you that encouragement. Thank you. Because <laughs> it makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. Um, it's huge. I mean, it's, it's such a resource because it's, see, being there, being there and seeing it, there's just no, there's no. And, 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 the, and, the, and the news um, when the uh, celebration, the settlement celebration happened right after the expiration of the moratorium in the news with the the settlement that lifted the, uh, the blue and the white balloons, and, had, mm. and they had busloads of people coming in from all over the world, and there were stuff, there were many Christian groups that came to be part of that celebration also. When you look at the makeup of the group that came in to celebrate, there were many Christian groups that came from Europe and around the world to celebrate this being, you know, the, um, the, the continued move, this is given us out of the Zionist theology, the continued movement toward Jesus' second coming. Jesus second coming, yeah. And that we will be, we are celebrating with you in this ongoing settlement because until it becomes an entirely, you know, Jewish state, Jesus right. isn't going to come again. It's part of that theology. And um, I find that really, I find that really vexing as a Christian pastor uh, when, you know, we have, uh, we have certainly more than one Christian narrative in this also. And you touched on Christian Zionism, but that's part of what we have di in different and, and uh, varying ways in our congregation. What, give, what gives me hope is that um, that there's a, a broad, huge, vast Christian mainstream that has no use for that theology mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, is reachable. Mm -hmm. Those folks who turned up for that, and the John Hagee and the yeah. Goofy folks, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. It's, it's, no more than I would talk to, to, um, to settlers who, who believe that, uh, you know, for their part, that, that they have a, a, a divine right to the land, and that the, the Palestinians are, you know, it's too bad for them, but they should go to some Arab country, the other Arabs. There's no, there's no reaching them. They, they need to be they need to be marginalized. And I talk about this in the book. What if someday those folks would be as marginalized as, <clears throat> hopefully they'll still stay marginalized, as the, I uh, can't remember the word for them, but you know, people in this country who uh, you know, pulling out with, with, with guns and, and, uh, and supplies for years survival. In, in the mountains, the survivalists, they're marginalized. We don't take them seriously. We may be scared of them. But they're marginalized. And the conditions led to extremist effect condition to everyone. I'm sorry? The conditions, the miserable conditions, enable extremists to dictate conditions to yes. everyone. Mm -hmm. Most of the Israeli population, most of the Palestinian population don't share these views. That's true. And people like Saad Arikat doing a lot of efforts to change the Israeli opinion mm -hmm. to show that there's problem. Can you give us again the information about this group? 
Minds of Peace. Minds, Minds of Peace. And are you on the internet? Yes, absolutely. Minds of Peace. We talk about South Africa. In South Africa, there was CODESA, Conventional Democratic South Africa. Mm -hmm. So we tried to build a major public negotiating congress when representative of the Israeli people meet representative of the Palestinian yeah. people to discuss, to yes. debate. And there's a lot to learn from the South Africans. There needs to be a lot more talking and conversations going on. And Northern Ireland, same thing. All party talks mm -hmm. to involve the people. 